Praise be Jesus and Mary. Now and forever. In one of her messages to Ruth Ann, Our Lady said that she would like the commandments and the catechism of the Catholic Church to be taught here at the farm. So with that in mind, we'll begin a new series of reflections on the Ten Commandments, remembering Jesus' words. He says in the Gospel of Matthew, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19, verse 17. The commandments are also called the Decalogue, which means literally the ten words. First three deal directly with our relationship with God. The last seven with our relations with others. They're referred to as the first table of the law and the second table of the law, respectively. The catechism at number 2059 says the, gifts of the gift of the commandments is a gift of God himself and his holy will. In making his will known, God reveals himself to his people. So if you're not sure what God's will is for you, here's the most important part of it, loud and clear. Keep the commandments, right? We'll add to that what the Apostle says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and you're more than halfway home with what God wants for you, with what his will is for you. The Apostle says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification means to become like God. So keep the commandments and become more like God in your thinking, your words, your actions, your reactions. That's clearly God's will for each and every one of us. Growth in the spiritual life really does revolve around those two principles. And very importantly, the Catechism adds at number 2062, it says the commandments properly so-called come in second place. They express the implications of belonging to God through the establishment of the covenant. Moral existence is a response to the Lord's loving initiative, unquote. So keeping the commandments is actually a response to God's love for us. It's our response to the fact that he's made us his adopted children. You don't keep the commandments to earn God's love. He already loves you infinitely, and he welcomes you. He accepts you as well. You don't have to do anything to earn his love. The more we take to heart God's love for us, the more we'll want to obey his commandments, and the easier it will be for us to do so as well. As the psalmist says, he says, The law of the Lord revives the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right, gladdening the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8. So we'll understand all of that the more we take God's love to heart and interiorize it. Number 2070 of the Catechism says that the Ten Commandments, quote, are fundamentally immutable and they oblige always and everywhere. No one can dispense from them, unquote. So the point to be made here is that times may change, but God doesn't change. His laws don't change. Vice and virtue don't change. Human beings don't change either. What was wrong yesterday is, believe it or not, still wrong today and will be wrong tomorrow as well. What was right yesterday is right today and it'll still be right tomorrow. There are nuances and subtleties regarding the commandments and moral theology, which hopefully we'll get an opportunity to explain some of in these reflections, but know that God expects us to be faithful to all of his commandments. Ultimately, he gives us the commandments for our own protection and for our own well-being. They're not for his benefit. They're actually for ours. And remember, God never commands the impossible. Whatever he commands, he makes possible by his grace. There are two sides to the coin with each commandment. The one side tells us what to do. The other side tells us what not to do. So the commandments prescribe certain things and they prohibit other things, prescription and prohibition, yes and no. Try to highlight those as we walk through each one. Today we'll talk about the first commandment. The Catechism talks about it in paragraphs 2083 through 2141. What's the first commandment? I am the Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me. Or as Jesus quotes it, he says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Matthew 4, verse 10. 
So after liberating the Israelites from Egypt, from the place of polytheism, which means where many gods were worshipped there, that's what polytheism means, many gods, the first law that God laid down for his people is that they were to be monotheists. They were to only worship the one true God, because in reality, there's only really one God. False gods abound even in our day today, but the true God is and always will be only one. The Catechism says at number 2086, the first commandment embraces faith, hope, and charity. When we say God, we confess a constant, unchangeable being, always the same, faithful and just, without any evil. It follows that we must necessarily accept his words and have complete faith in him and acknowledge his authority. He's almighty, merciful, and infinitely beneficent, unquote, says the Catechism. So the first commandment embraces faith, hope, and charity. So it's tied to what are called those three theological virtues, all of which point to God. We'll say a word on each of those virtues. The virtue of faith is both a gift, it's also an obligation, too. By faith, I assent and adhere to all the truths that God has revealed and which the church proposes for our belief. That's number 1814 in the Catechism. So if you dissent regarding the teachings of the church rather than assent to them, you actually don't have the theological virtue of faith. To put it bluntly, instead of being faithful, you are faithless. Dissent from church teaching, therefore, it's a sin against the first commandment. And Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we have to be careful on that one. The virtue of hope tells me, what to, tells me to desire and also to expect from God both the gift of eternal life and also the graces I need to attain that gift. We read that in number 1817 of the Catechism. Then the virtue of charity helps me to love God above all things for his own sake. It also helps me to love my neighbor as myself for the love of God. So the virtues of faith, hope, and love are all bound up with the first commandment. If you're faithful to the first commandment, you'll have the security of faith, the comfort of hope, and the joy which belongs to charity. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So regarding service, we serve God through adoration, prayer, sacrifice, promises and vows, and through evangelization as well. We'll say a word on each of these, too. To adore God, in Latin it's latria. It means to acknowledge Him as God, to respect Him, to submit to Him, to praise Him, to humble yourself before Him, even to be grateful towards Him for what you have. One of the most painful experiences of a parent is to have an ungrateful child, right? Some of you who are parents know that. Imagine how God feels with us at times, right? So let's try to focus on what we should be grateful for. If you're looking for a way or a place to adore God, Eucharistic adoration is a great place to start, right? In the Eucharist, you can acknowledge God. You can see Jesus there as God. You can submit to him. You can praise him. You can humble yourself before him. And we know that the word Eucharist means thanksgiving, right? So you can express your gratitude to God in the sacrament of gratitude known as the Holy Eucharist. Regarding prayer, the Catechism says at number 2098 that prayer is an indispensable condition for being able to obey God's commandments. So if someone really struggles with obeying, with keeping the commandments, the first question you should ask them is what? How's your prayer life? What's your prayer life like? In order to obey, you have to pray. You have to do that. Otherwise, you won't have the grace to live how the Lord wants you to live. Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. Matthew 7, 7. Ask in prayer for the grace to obey and God will give it to you. You'll find it. With sacrifice, we're called to offer God our time, our talents, our gifts, our financial resources, and most importantly, God wants us to offer Him our hearts, too. An external sacrifice without internal faith actually doesn't have a lot of spiritual value, 
to it. Sacrifice also means that we unite ourselves to the one perfect sacrifice of Jesus, which is where? On the cross. So we can make our lives or also pleasing and acceptable to God. We can make ourselves also a pleasing sacrifice, just as Jesus did. Where do we do that, especially? At the Mass, also known as the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The First Commandment also includes things like promises and vows, too. So promises to God include what you said in baptism, and our confirmation promises, when we're going to make that, too. Also our marriage promises, the promises that those of us who are members of the clergy made when we received holy orders, too. Even personal devotional promises to God are something that we can offer Him as a form of worship. And vows include things like public vows. So as a religious, what do I profess? Poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's public vow to follow Jesus more closely. Also, they can be private vows, too. Some people vow things to God, but in reality, what they're doing is they're really making a resolution instead of a vow. I vow to do this, but they're really making a resolution. If you're actually confused about that, about the difference, you can ask a priest or a spiritual director. They can help you make the distinction there. Lastly, regarding service, there's what's called evangelization. Evangelization means not keeping your faith a private affair. It means actually sharing it with other people. The catechism at number 2105 says that the social duty of Christians is to respect and awaken in each man the love of the truth and the good. It requires them to make known the worship of the one true religion which subsists in the Catholic and apostolic church. The first commandment here actually includes also the right to religious liberties as well. So when governments and employers do away with the rights of conscience of their workers and employees, as is happening in our country, that's actually a violation of the first commandment, believe it or not. What are other sins against the first commandment? Well, sins against the virtue of faith would include refusing to believe or voluntarily doubting the truths of the faith. So believing that abortion or contraception or euthanasia are acceptable, or believing that homosexual activity is acceptable, or believing that Our Lady wasn't a virgin or that she wasn't immaculately conceived or wasn't assumed into heaven or not believing that Jesus rose bodily from the dead, not believing that he's present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist, not believing that you have to, serious, you have to confess your serious sins to, to, the, to a priest. I don't have to do that. Uh, no, that's actually a sin against the faith. Those are examples of sins against the faith. They're called heresies, actually. There are many other heresies as well. We have to be careful about what we believe in life. There's also what's called apostasy, which is the total repudiation or rejection of the Christian faith. There's also schism, which is refusing to submit to the Roman pontiff, refusing to be in full communion with the church. Those are sins against the faith as well. <clears throat> sins against the virtue of hope are the two extremes, presumption and despair. So you've got presumption on one end, so thinking you can save yourself without God's help or thinking that God will forgive you, but you don't have to repent or change. Those are both presumptions. It's also despair on the other end, which means you give up hope of your own salvation. You think that God can't or won't save you. That type of thinking is contrary to God's goodness. It's contrary to his mercy and to his faithfulness as well. So both presumption and despair, they're not from God. And whatever is, isn't from God, we have to say no to that. Whatever doesn't come from God, you've got to reject it. If God didn't send it to you, send it back, right? It means learn to reject negative and dark thoughts because they aren't from the Lord of love. Sins against charity include indifference towards God, ingratitude, lukewarmness, so neither hot nor cold, spiritual laziness, which is sloth, and obviously hatred towards God. Superstition is also a sin against the first commandment. Superstition, what does that include? Using tarot cards. It includes Ouija boards, palm readings, horoscopes, witchcraft, spell casting, seances, any type of satanic practice. 
Superstition actually means trying to have spiritual power or insight apart from God. Not a good idea. If you get it, it's going to be from the demons, not from God. The Lord doesn't want us to have anything apart from him. Plus, if we go down those roots again, it'll be the devil who's leading us, not the Lord. The devil wants to lead us to hell, not to heaven. So don't follow his lead. Idolatry, it's another sin against the first commandment. It means worshiping false gods, but it also means honoring and reverencing a creature in place of God. The Catechism mentions here worshiping Satan, but it also talks about making idols of power and pleasure and race and ancestors and the state and money and other things. Number 21, 13. So when someone or something other than God becomes your God, that's idolatry. Could be another person. It could be a relationship. Could be a substance addiction even. It could be status, it could be other people's opinions of me, it could be a certain job position or being successful, as the world understands it. There are a lot of idols vying for our worship that we have to learn to reject. Other sins against the first commandment are atheism, obviously, and agnosticism. Also, simony, which means buying and selling spiritual things. Sacrilege, which means profaning or treating unworthily the sacraments and other liturgical actions, as well as people or things or places that are consecrated to God. So receiving Holy Communion in a state of mortal sin, that's actually a sacrilege. Can't do that. Having relations with someone who's consecrated or a priest or injuring them intentionally, those are sacrileges too. Stealing from a church, that's a sacrilege as well. So it's not just theft. It's also sacrilege, too. Also, priests celebrating sacraments that they don't have permission to celebrate are daily committing sacrileges. The SSPX, for example, which we like to mention quite frequently. Tempting God without good reason, so putting his goodness and power to the test by word or deed because you doubt his love, his providence, or his power, those are sins as well. So tempting God means hoping or expecting an unusual manifestation from him. When Satan told Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple because God would save him in Matthew chapter 4, he was baiting Jesus to tempt the heavenly father. Jesus isn't dumb. He didn't take the bait. He knows better than to do that. Also, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith declared in November of 1983, said that the faithful who enroll in Masonic associations are in a state of grave sin and may not receive Holy Communion. So being enrolled with the Masons is actually a serious sin against the first commandment. Apart from a few subtle distinctions that need to be made at times, all of those sins that we mentioned are mortal sins, meaning that in and of themselves, they are serious, they're grave so if you commit them knowing that you're, they're serious sins and there's full or sufficient consent of your will in committing them, then you're actually guilty of mortal sin. So you kill the life of grace in your soul. You have to go to confession to be restored of that. If you sincerely don't know that some of those are serious sins and some of them aren't really evident right off the bat, well, or you commit them, but your will is compromised in a serious way, or your passions or your fear take over, and then more often than not, you'll be guilty of a venial sin. So lack of full knowledge, lack of full consent is a mitigating factor. It diminishes the seriousness of the sin. That applies for all the commandments, by the way. God's not unfair. God's not out to get you. He's out to save you, not to get you. And he's merciful with us, too. But he wants us to have a well-formed conscience. And that's the reason that we'll be giving these reflections. And God willing, we'll be able to finish them, too. Hopefully, we'll finish what we started. We'll conclude by saying that the Lord wants and needs to be first in our life. That's why he wants put honoring and worshiping him as the first commandment. The more we do what is right and avoid what is wrong, the more we'll have God's protection. God's blessing, and his grace also to live in the freedom that belongs to the children of God. So let's ask Our Lady today for the grace to know the truth regarding God's commandments. 
Let's also ask her for the grace to be able to live them as well. Living the commandments means that we stop fighting against God and God himself begins to fight for us. He begins to take up our cause, as it were. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever.